So the study design. So how do you write the study design in your in your method section? Now, in order to understand how you write it, we've also got to think a little bit about the study des design we've employed. So what we'll start off with is we'll start by looking at the way in which you write this, which will then pose some questions for us in terms of what study designs actually um, are made from their construction. So here we've got our method. And the first thing that we always uh, report is the study design because the study design has been driven from what has come prior to that. So it's been driven from the hypotheses in the which I presented in the introduction, which stems from the testable question, also in the introduction, which stems from the rationale in the introduction, which stems from the general background in the introduction, which stems from the title of the research study. So we don't get into the method section and report the participants because the participants and what we've actually done are a function of the, the study design itself. And the study design is here. And it states, well, using a quasi-experimental repeated measures crossover design, participants completed two protocols for the assessment of grip strength with three trials being completed within each protocol. So in many ways, the, the first sentence is setting the scene and the second, se the second part of that sentence is, is completing it for us. So we're going to discuss more of these in detail in the rest of this video, but the wording is actually fairly clear. Where it is repeated measures, it simply means that your participant has repeated the measure more than once. So that could be, for example, a pre to post. So it could be in a study where we've had um, a measurement taken at the start, then they've gone away and trained, and we've measured their, their um, the variables again at the end. That is a repeated measures. So here, the participants have been asked to repeat the measure three times. We've also employed in this example a crossover design. So in a crossover design, we are asking the participants who did, for example, protocol one, so half, half of the group may have done protocol one first and half may have done protocol two first. We then swap them over and those that are in two do one, those that are in one do two. So it allows everybody to do the, 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 the both trials. And the reason we use crossover designs are to avoid things like biasing the data, learning effects and, and so on and training effects. So what we've got is two protocols They've crossed over, so it tells us the design, and they've used repeated measures. So the final thing we'll talk about in a bit more detail as we go back into the next part of this little video is what we mean by, for example, quasi-experimental. But that allows the reader to see, and that's how you would write out, so they can see what you've done from the wording that's on the page in terms of your, your experimental design. So let's delve in a little bit. So when you're thinking about structuring the design of your study, so structuring the design will lead to the way in which you've written it. You always think, well, OK, it's, you start your writing with this paragraph because it sets out, as you saw, what was undertaken in, in, that, in that study. And that then leads into the, you know, the description of your participant and then what you've actually done in terms of data collection. As I, as I said previously, they are functions of that study design. So everything in, in science is done to avoid ambiguity. And so to avoid ambiguity, what we do is we do everything in an order. What leads to what? And so study design leads into the, into the participants. The participants don't drive the study design. The study design is what drives the participants and it's what drives the method of data collection. One of the things to think a little bit about when you are, when you are writing these kind of methods is what kind of studies have you done? Have you, you know, have you done things like a descriptive study or an analytical study, or have you done a kind of a group comparison study, interventional versus non-interventional, or where you've got kind of control over the interventional randomization, which is what you saw in the example, because you can see there is quasi-experimental. So we'll deal with these very briefly, some quite quickly and others in a bit more detail. So if you're not sure a descriptive study is one which is really just describing the population or the parameters or association now fundamentally that is a study which generates a hypothesis it is not a study that that 
tries to answer a hypothesis. So in, in those kind of studies, it tends to be associated more with what we call epidemiological studies, where big group data sets have been looked at. We don't really know. They've kind of done what we call a phishing exercise. They've collected the data. And from that, somebody else may be able to generate a hypothesis. It's a descriptive overview. Most studies that we do, though, tend to be kind of more analytical because they're trying to answer um, these causal questions, hypotheses, testing based studies. It might be, though, that you've got a study which is reporting the comparative versus non-comparative nature. So is there what we call a group comparison? So are you comparing, for example, males to females? Are you comparing um, athletes to non-athletes? It might be a kind of study where you're using interventional versus non-interventional. So has an intervention been evaluated? Maybe, as you see within, for example, training studies. So where it gets more, more sophisticated, more complicated, is that we can take that notion of an intervention and apply the idea of randomization. Now, I think sometimes we think that randomization is, is, is not you know, a very clever thing to do. But where you're working in big data sets, so where we're using, for example, evaluations of vaccines, or we're looking at evaluations of medic medicines, you recruit really big population groups. And what you do is by the process of randomization, you put people into the into the either the group that gets the vaccine or the group that doesn't get the vaccine. Where randomization doesn't work is potentially where you've got very small groups um, of, of individuals or where we are trying to maintain what we call homogeneity within the group. We're trying to control the group. So, for example, if I'm trying to compare athletes to non-athletes, I can't allocate pe people by randomization into those groups. They have to be allocated. And so that's where we get into the idea of what we call experimental, quasi-experimental and observational studies. So a study that is experimental is allows randomization. And these are really defined as the highest order of study, but they require these big. So in these kind of experimental studies, you have what we call direct control, both of the intervention and of um, or the factors in, in that intervention, but also more importantly about the way you allocate the participants you use this randomization process. And this is classically used, as I say, in things like medicine, where they use randomized control trials. In a quasi-experimental study, which is what you saw in the example in the, in the assignment, you control the intervention, but you do not implement randomization. So these are kind of the non-randomized trials. This is where we might use things like matched pairs. It might be where we use um, blinded uh, studies or we use crossover design studies. But we haven't, in essence, used randomization to put people into those groups. Tends to be associated with smaller sample sizes. Tends to be associated where we perhaps have got these kind of more match matched observations. And then finally, you've got these observational studies. So if it's an observational study and you're not sure what it is, well, think about it very logically. If you cannot control the intervention, all the factors that you're studying and do not impl implement randomization, then by definition, you're doing an observational based study. And if we just look at this flow diagram, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but if you look at this flow diagram, it will give you a little bit more of a sense of kind of what is what you're, you're, you're looking for. If you kind of look in the, the, the to, to the left, you've got what we call the inductive and deductive. So that is your notion of being the testable question. And then you've got kind of the strategy. Is it an opinion? Is it empirical? Is it archival? Is it analytic? And then you get down into the kind of the, the, the technique that you're going to Im, Im, employ. So if we're kind of dealing with empirical research, which is kind of the data driven research, then it's everything from case controlled to observational studies. They all, all kind of fall into those, those kind of approaches. So it might be that we even use simulations, for example, in, in those in those studies. But it's worth kind of thinking carefully about what your study design 
looks like. And so the final consideration is not only have we got these three levels of studies, our experimental, quasi-experimental and observational, but they also have kind of a tick box exercise which goes with them. Studies can be um, randomised, they can be non-randomised. So a randomised study is experimental. Quasi-experimental and observation, as we already stated, cannot be randomised based um, studies. We can then think about matched pairs. So in a matched pair study, it's where you, as the experimenter, have created the groups. So you may have matched the groups on, for example, VO2 max. So what you've done is you've put two people into two groups. You've got a group that are going to do training and a group that aren't going to do training. And you match them in those groups based upon their VO2 maxes. So that the average VO2 max for those groups should be fairly similar. So a great way of thinking about this is you, 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 you test 20 people. You rank the 20 people for VO2 max. And then you take the two highest scores for VO2 max and you put them in the training group and then the other one in the non-training group. Then you take the next two highest scores and you put them in the one in the training group, one in the non-training group. So we create matched groups. Then we've got blinded. So in a blinded study, what that means is, is that the participant is blinded to the intervention. So, for example, this is what we might do when we're giving people um, vaccines or where we're giving people um, beetroot juice or we're using ergogenic aids. We don't want them to know what they've ingested because that can bias the results. So what we do is we blind them to what it is. So we, we, we use placebo. But we tend to also try and employ, which is the next level of sophistication, what's called double blinded. So that is when not only is the participant blinded, but so is the experimenter. And that really takes away any ambiguity and it prevents any bias. Because if, if, if as the experimenter, I know what the participant is taking, there is, there is a potential for, for you to bias the outcomes of the study, particularly, for example, in an exercise test. And, and you go, crikey, they've taken the, the stuff I want to see work. You get them to work a little bit harder to try and produce the results you want. So we blind you as the experimenter and we blind the participant as well. And that's a doubly blinded study. We have crossover. So in a crossover study, that might be that you've got um, a, a group of individuals that... Um, have done a training intervention and a group that haven't done a training intervention and then we swap them over. So the group that didn't train are now going to, to, to not do anything and the group that did train, so the group that didn't train are going to go and train and the group that didn't train are not going to train. So we just cross everything over. And then the final thing is that repeated measures. So a repeated measure study is where the participants have the measure repeated upon them. So there is no reason why you couldn't have a matched pairs, double-blinded, crossover, repeated measures design. So it's, it's possible, but can you see that that becomes a quasi-experimental study? Because the one thing that makes a study experimental is randomization. And randomization is the highest order of experimental design. But remember, it only really works if you've got large data sets. So when you are thinking about your experimental design and you're thinking about what you're going to write in that study design, think very carefully about what's, what it is that you, you've undertaken before you actually submit that into the method section itself.